Welcome to FYI, I'm Barry Z. Van, and it's such a joy to welcome a man who those of you who are watching around the world on YouTube may not know, but for those of us here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota and even other parts of the country, uh, uh, a great anchor and an Emmy winner, Don Shelby, uh, who was former anchor at uh, WCCO-TV Channel 4 here in Minneapolis, a CBS-owned station, and uh, Don, welcome to our show. Thanks, Barry. Thank you very much. It's great to be in your company. Well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> now I'm rattled and I won't be able to say anything else. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and of course, the, the same to you. Um, there is so much through which you've been, and, uh, but I have to, have to ask, uh, well, I don't have to, but I want to ask, the na you, you're a native of Muncie, Indiana, but there are so many towns in Indiana and so many things that identified it with uh, the name Shelby in Indiana. Are you part of that, that Shelby family, Shelbyville and Shelby bicycles, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, anything named Shelby, I'm associated with shirt tail wise. Okay. There is uh, Shelby County in uh, Tennessee where Memphis is. Uh, there's Shelby, Kentucky, Shelby, Montana, Shelby, California. Uh, I had a peripatetic set of uh, ancestors, uh, particularly on the male side, who uh, traveled around the uh, country. One was a I've been able to detect was a riverboat gambler who left his family after the birth of his children. My grandfather was the first male Shelby in eight generations to have met his father. Wow. So uh, the men got up and uh, headed out and uh, procreated. Very pro prolific, too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> must, and must have done pretty well to have things named after them. Oh, my goodness, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Shelby, Montana is a little cold, but that yes, that's <laughs> true. That. That's true. <laughs> well, how how did this all happen uh, that you got into the news business? Well, I was just a big show off, Barry. That's I just wanted detention. I went to a very small school, a very small county school, fifty four kids in my senior class, and if anyone uh, was ever required to give a speech, it was me. If anyone was ever required to give the invocation at a banquet, it was me. If anyone ever needed someone to act in a play, it was me. If anyone had to read the announcements in the morning from the principal's office, it was going to be me. Uh, and it was something that I adored because uh, I just had uh, this show-off streak in me that craved attention and uh, craved acknowledgement. And so I thought I was going to be an actor I went to the University of Cincinnati and I was going to be uh, a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker. And then I was attracted to radio. And I remember telling my mother my second year, she said, what are you going to be? And I said, I'm going to be the most famous billboard disc jockey of the year. <laughs> and so I started as a disc jockey and then I noticed that uh, the guy threw the pane in the window in the studio who did five minutes of news at the top of the hour was getting the same pay as I was. And I went, well, I'm in the wrong business. This is requiring a lot more work and a lot more charm and a lot more reading of joke books to manage this 55 minutes on the air. I'm just going to do what that guy does. And so I started reading news. And then I started being associated in Cincinnati with uh, WCPO, then in Washington, D.C., at MAL and WAVA, then to Charleston, South Carolina, WCIV. Then I jumped from the 99th market to the fifth largest market when I went to Houston, worked for the uh, estimable Ray Miller down there and uh, KPRC-TV, NBC. And then was hired in 1978 at WCCO on the same day that Pat Miles was hired, we uh, were hired as a team to anchor the weekend news and uh, still one of my all-time best buddies. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady. Yes. I've only met her a couple of times, but what a sweet lady from Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Kennett. 
Kenneth. Kenneth. Oh. Yeah. And that's the way she says it. Ken it's Kenneth. K E N N E T T. Mm -hmm. But but if you wake her up in the middle of the night, which I've never done, but if you were to surprise her and say, "Where are you from?" She'd say, "Kenneth." <laughs> Kenneth. I love it. I love it. Um, KPRC, uh, a fellow with whom I worked in D.C., uh, you and I worked for the same boss uh, yes. at different years, but uh, uh, was uh, Dan Lovett, was he there at, at KPRC? I don't remember Dan at that time. Uh, we were probably there at different times. Uh -huh. I was there uh, 74 to 78. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he would have been with us in D.C. at yeah. that time. Right. Yeah. But, um, and Jessica Savage, too. Yeah, she, Jess, was, uh, Jess was there, and uh, Linda Ellerby. I knew Linda really well. And, um, Still and keep who in touch. else was, uh, <laughs> Tom Gerald. These are names that people may not, the, the younger people who are watching will not remember, but these were giants in broadcasting. Yeah, Linda uh, has retired now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, particularly right after Nancy Dickerson, there was a dearth of uh, female reporters. And, uh, and Jess Savage did a, a terrific job of breaking through all the way to anchoring on the network. And Linda uh, had her own show. Mm -hmm. And they came out of that shop. And then Dan Rather, of course, was just across the street. So uh, he would come to visit from time to time. And then later on, we, we worked together when he was anchoring mm -hmm. CBS. He ascended to the Cronkite position uh, six months before I ascended to the Dave Moore position. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a story, I don't know if it's true, but uh, that Cronkite was originally scheduled to be the anchor at CCO TV, and he didn't show up for work, for the audition. No, he did. Uh, oh, he, he did? did? He called in and said he could He, he had gotten the job at uh, CBS television. He was a CBS radio right. guy, primarily. And they had given him some small jobs on television, but he really had a, a desire uh, to be in television news. And the uh, job posting came at CCO, and he accepted the job. So Cronkite was in, hired by WCCO, and then he called and said, I've taken this television piece. I think it was You Are There or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a... a, a perfectly uh, standard news gig, mm -hmm. but You Are There was one of the great shows. Oh yeah, where, it was marvelous. The Redential Insurance Company of America presents. <laughs> there you go. You Are There. <laughs> so I understand though that Dave Moore was sitting in the lobby or something waiting to do something and somebody said, Cronkite has just turned down this job. That's basically how it happened, yeah. See, see, Dave had gone to the University of Minnesota He'd, he, and uh, out of Washburn High School and with uh, two of his buddies uh, out of Washburn, uh, Peter Graves and James Arness. Uh, they all were hung around together, lived in the same neighborhood. So after graduation from the theater school, they all went to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Peter Graves, of course, stuck, who's the brother of James Arness, mm -hmm. James Arness, That's right. the way they said him. And uh, they stayed, and he drove back, kind of tail between his legs, didn't know what he was going to do, and he applied for a, a job performing. He thought maybe he'd be a booth announcer or something like that, but they made him the news guy, and then the rest is history, and yeah. uh, became the most recognizable news figure uh, in the state of Minnesota. Had a higher Q rating than uh, the governor or the president mm. in this state. I don't, I don't doubt it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had the uh, good fortune, a little sidebar, to uh, when I was at Channel 11, we did features on uh, famous Minnesotans, and so we did a piece in Peter Graves' house in Santa Monica, yes. <laughs> and it was <laughs> very baronial, <laughs> I should say, uh, something you would expect from Peter Graves. Of Never got to meet uh, Jim Arness, though, or Arness. Um, you've, you've had an incredible career. Uh, in, in news and in life. Uh, speaking of life, first I'd like to address, first of all, you had a hole in your heart, and that was very well known uh, in the market, and everybody was praying for you a lot. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, the prayers, I'm absolutely convinced, uh, 
uh, kept me alive. I had what's called a PFO, a patent form in O'Valley, in the septal wall of the heart, and so a blood clot went through, and, and I had a couple of strokes. And, uh, and, and really, uh, it destroyed about two-thirds of my cerebellum. Uh, you could see that on the CAT scan. And, uh, and I was told, uh, point blank, by the people who were looking at the CAT scan that I would no longer work, that I would be unable to form full sentences, that I would be able to speak, uh, that my career was basically over. And I remember in therapy, I was testing um, my mental acuity was at about the fifth or sixth grade level right after the strokes. And so it became apparent to me that something uh, horrible had occurred. And I just kept chugging and kept working and kept doing the exercises and studying and memorizing. And, and it came back. And in fact, you'll be familiar with this. They kept asking his CCO when I would come back, and the doctor was saying, you need to be down for three or four months before you undertake anything strenuous, uh, before any stress, stressful situations arise. But uh, I was down for a month because the May, May ratings period was beginning. <laughs> and I said, I'm back. But Barry, I had to, my balance was so bad when I was anchoring, I had to, uh, if you look at those early uh, pictures, I was holding the desk underneath because I didn't know whether I was leaning. I didn't know whether I was falling over. My balance had gone completely. Wow. And it's come back and I'm oh, fine now. Nobody would ever know that anything was ever wrong. I always describe it this way, <clears throat> that uh, from the outside looking in, then I'm perfectly normal. From the inside looking out, I know every deficit that I have. So the trick is to, as it is in life, uh, the deficits that we all have, whether they're caused by a physical anomaly or a mental uh, acuity or by intelligence, uh, those you don't let show. And so I never put myself in a position where some of those debilitated parts of me ever have to be demonstrated. That's incredible. What, what discipline, though. It does require some, yeah. some strength. Yeah. Do you, did you, it sounds corny uh, and it's very simplistic, but when you were going through this, did you mentally say to yourself, I have to, I have to get over this? I mean, did you force yourself uh, yeah. Emotionally. Yeah, you read that perfectly well. That's exactly what I did. Wow. Yeah. I had uh, three daughters and a wife. Wow. And uh, I was the breadwinner, and uh, that was going to continue. It's fabulous. And I had, I had other things to say. I had other things to do. I had business to conduct. I had things to tell the people that I thought they should know. Sure. And I, I wanted that. Well, thank God you've uh, emerged <laughs> very successfully. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, you've seen hardship uh, during your career, and you did a lot in Romania. Can you refresh the memory of those of us who saw this parts of this series that you did, and how that how did that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked about that because it is the uh, most important work that I ever did as a journalist in 55 years. When Nicolae Ceausescu, who was the dictator in Romania, was assassinated in a popular uprising, what the public found out they didn't know, the public in Romania, was that because he had uh, put out a decree that all women of childbearing age have as many children as possible, he was a megalomaniac, and even though the boundaries of Romania were never going to grow, he wanted the population to grow so he would be in power over more people. Uh, if you were a woman and did not bear children and you were healthy enough to do so, you were imprisoned. They had a secret police force that uh, would take women out of their homes and put them in prison for not having children. And all birth control was outlawed. But uh, people with uh, fairly large families and women uh, who had already given birth were told to uh, 
have more children and they couldn't afford to raise the children that they had. And so the state stepped in and took all those children away from them and housed them in these terrible warehouses where they, uh, some of them, uh, to the age of six or seven years old, never were allowed outside of a crib. They were, they were inside of a jail. Never touched, never felt any nurturing. And so we were the first American journalists over there. And I told that story in, in five parts, later expanded to many, many more parts as we did follow-ups three times. And the wonderful thing is that about a thousand Minnesotan families adopted children from Romania. And I want to tell you how that story ends. So there's a, a million middle parts to that story, but here's how the story uh, has this uh, a false ending because it continues to be told. So I was giving a speech in, uh, in Brainerd, and it was, uh, Lots of people there, and an and owner of a marina came up and said, uh, Mike, come, come over to my table. This is before the speech. Come over to my table and, and meet uh, one of my employees. And I went over there, and the big strapping young guy, about 30 years old, and I reached out to shake his hand, and he just hugged me. And, uh, and I hugged him back, and, and he said, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. And I said, I, I'm, I don't understand. And he said, I'm a no Romanian orphan. Oh my and God. there's my mother over there. And she saw your show and she came and got me. Wow. Had two kids come up to me while I was working the state fair. Big tall kid, 6'6". Six, six. And a, a younger girl, looked like him, uh, came up to me. We were at the CCO booth and we we're signing autographs, pictures. And Mr. Shelby, uh, could we have your autograph? And I said, certainly. And he said, do you remember us? And you know you've been through this a million times. You don't say, I have no idea who you are. You know, you try to, you try to say something like, of course I do. I, sure. You know, it's been a long time. Or, you don't want to insult them. And, and uh, I said, but I've forgotten your names. And he said, well, this is, uh, my name is Bobby, and this is Becky. He said, I play basketball uh, up in uh, Moundsview, and uh, she's the cheerleader. And I thought, oh, that's great, because I'd written a book about basketball, and I love basketball. So I uh, to Bobby and Becky, and I got Bobby and Becky written, and I went, Bobby and Becky, Bobby and Becky. And I looked at them, and then they said, you carried us off the plane. Oh my God. Wow. And these were just as American kids as American could be. Wow. Great parents. Ziggy Calls was a basketball coach. Popular kids, successful kids. And they would be, if they were left there, because some kids were left in the orphanage and uh, got old, uh, too old to be actually uh, kept in the orphanage, and, and they've turn to prostitution and drug addiction and they live in the sewers of Bucharest now. Mm. And to know that, but for that story, and I don't claim any credit, uh, I, I, the story came to me. Uh, I didn't go out searching for the story. The story came to me and then and, and we followed the story. Yeah. Whose idea was it to, to do that? It, it was the idea of uh, a couple, couple of sources. One was uh, an adoption agency uh, that had gotten word that there was trouble in Romania, and a family of uh, a man and a woman who uh, were childless and had talked to the agency and said, we're going. And I said, well, hold on, we'll go with you. Wow. And then we had a, uh, a wonderful woman Lucia Anderson here, who was originally from Romania, electrical engineer, and she spoke fluent Romanian, and we took her. And then she became the, uh, basically the star of the show mm -hmm. because she managed all of this and got all of these adoptions to happen. I assume after Ceausescu uh, was killed, 
and uh, couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. <laughs> what a terrible man. Yes. Uh, monster. Um, the welcome for you in Romania must have been really very, very warm. It was, was extremely sure. warm. At the same time, uh, a, a bit of national embarrassment took place. And that was all of these children were being adopted out all over the United States and all over Europe. And that became a point for the new president, Jan Iliescu, who said, we're ashamed. We can't care for our own children. We can't absorb them into our population. We need uh, some help. We need most favored nation trading status with the United States. And uh, we did first Western journalist to do the, an interview with uh, President Iliescu. And, and you could tell he was, uh, this, this problem chafed him. And I said, give it 30 years. Because who knows, if these adoptions are successful, the entire Congress of the United States of America could be made up of Romanian children. Which is true. And he, and he tears pouring down his face. I said, then you'll get most favored nation trading status. No. And fortunately, we have developed a, a new relationship. I was going to ask yeah. if that uh, no. occurred. Yes. Um, Romania had had a troubled history along the way. It had, it had been a, a Soviet satellite. It had been uh, the supplier of oil for uh, the Nazi regime in Germany. So mm -hmm. it had a, a, a bad reputation. But Back here, the exodus of uh, Romanians uh, and immigrants to the United States uh, has so blessed uh, areas of St. Paul and Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota that I have fallen in with uh, the Romanian immigrants who are here. Uh, and they're fully American, but they still love their homeland and, and still think of the beauty of the Carpathian Mountains and even Transylvania, mm. uh, the beauty of that country in the Black Sea. So uh, my life has been enriched by my association with that country and with those people. And you've enriched so many thousands of lives. Just by good fortune. Well, their good fortune, our good fortune, to, to have you be the catalyst for that. Uh, switching really switching gears here now, uh, show business. You, um, you acted, and I'm sorry to say I don't recall the play. Maybe there have been several plays, but since you, since you retired, uh, I know you acted in one play, uh, but I can't remember which, which one it was, and I know you were wearing stockings. Oh, not <laughs> stockings. Be, be honest with the folks. I was wearing fishnet stockings. <laughs> Uh, yes, that was the Rocky Horror uh, show live. It was, uh, so people remember the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Sure. This was a live performance done at the uh, Lab Theater. And I did it right after I had uh, retired. And it was just the thrill of a lifetime to be able to do that. Great, great cast of characters. And I could rock some heels. I was wearing six inch stilettos besides the. Uh, the fishnet stockings. <laughs> but I've acted in a number of things. Said we did eight uh, at the uh, varsity. We did uh, a thing called Safe at Home for the Mixed Blood. Uh, and uh, I still do about uh, 50 Mark, one-man Mark Twain shows mm. every, every year. So. Wonderful. And work with uh, Vocal Essence. I'm on the board of Vocal Essence, the great choral uh, group. The ensemble singers and I uh, travel around the state uh, one month out of the year and perform uh, river songs and tales with Mark Twain. And we take that all around the, uh, we get the legacy grant to do that, which is fun. And so April this year will be in Detroit Lakes, Brainerd, Alexandria, Grand Rapids, and Hibbing. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. So you, you got to do the entire spectrum. Yes. You wanted to start in show business and you wound up in show And I, I, I think that is the full circle. I, I, I always had this love uh, of theater and 
there was this re uh, remarkable coincidence that took place in my life, and actually I don't believe in coincidences. I, there's something about fate that uh, enters into this, but Dave Moore uh, was one of the greatest gifts in my life. Dave was trained in theater as a performer and then learned uh, by doing journalism. He was not a journalism major, but became one of the most celebrated of all journalists as anchor of WCCL. I was trained as a journalist with just a smattering of, of theater in my background. And he taught me that anchoring on television and communicating was something that had to be done with a notion toward performance that you had to be a performer. You just couldn't get on there and look steely-eyed and wear a three-piece suit and set your jaw and list a litany of facts. You had to tell a story, and you had to tell the story in a, in a way that had its drama and its pathos and its humor and arc. And he taught me everything that I know today about how to be on television and without him, I would have been absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's marvelous. A wonderful tribute to Dave. Uh, I have the pleasure to be on the sag after board with Dave's son, Peter yes. Moore, uh, who definitely inherited he did. Uh, Dave's talents. Uh, Peter is one of the, the best actors uh, around, absolutely. anywhere, and director, yes. and a terrific director. And I think we're gonna pause here for a moment and continue our conversation on this a special one hour edition of FYI with Barry Zivan and uh, we'll be back with Don Shelby in just a moment. Children need many things to be ready for school. Crayons, notebooks, pencils, and good mental health, which is critical to their academic success. The real impact of what we do at Washburn Center for Children is seen in the stories of the children that we serve. Children like Bobby, who had an attention deficit disorder and found it really difficult to make friends. Children like Amy, who had such serious anxiety, she was failing tests regularly even though she knew the material. Left untreated mental health challenges can negatively impact a child's academic achievement. Children with social emotional behavior problems have the highest rate of school failure among any special education population. They also drop out of school at a rate that is twice that of other students. Washburn Center offers struggling children hope and was named one of the top 20 Minnesota nonprofits providing educational support for at risk youth. Compassionate therapeutic support helps children learn new skills so they can reach their full potential. Washburn Center's therapists serve 22 schools in the Eden Prairie, Bloomington, and Minneapolis school districts. In these schools, principals and social workers reduce suspensions and behavioral issues increased attendance, and improved academic performance. We're committed to giving children the tools they need to be happier, healthier, and more successful students. Back with John, Don Shelby now in this special one hour edition because Don has so much to say uh, that's of interest and inspiration really to, uh, especially to those of you who might want to enter the broadcast field. Why would anybody want to enter? <laughs> Some people would say, but no, it's, it's, it's very rewarding in so many ways because you, you get to meet so many people too and, and in every walk of life and it educates you. Yes. It educates you. That old saying from the King and I, uh, uh, a very ancient saying, uh, by your pupils you'll be taught. Absolutely and <laughs> right, absolutely. And I've, I've felt extremely uh, blessed uh, to be able to have met these people because, uh, as you said in the first the section of this program, I'm from a very small city and uh, a county town outside of the city. And uh, I think I was 16 years old and had, I had never met a mayor. I had never met a chief of police. Uh, I had certainly never met anybody who represented us in Congress. I had uh, 
I had a very small world. And, and, and now, uh, very similar uh, to uh, your experiences and, and, and your book, that uh, so you just shake your head and you say, wait a minute, I, I've interviewed kings and presidents and, uh, and, and called uh, members of Congress friends. Uh, nobody would believe that in my hometown. Mm -hmm. Nobody would believe that. And I go back from time to time. And I'm very careful not to say those things, to talk about those things. Because I know in my hometown those are experiences that they would uh, A, not believe, B, think I'm bragging, and uh, C, would feel bad about their own lives. Mm. So I don't talk about the experiences that I've had uh, when I go back home. That's very kind of you, in especially the, the third uh, uh, element you mentioned, uh, because when uh, we've both been very blessed, you've been extremely blessed. I've been sort of extremely blessed. But well, you've been very blessed. <laughs> but By reading your book, you, you have uh, been around some of the greats of all time. Well, thank you, Don. But what I was going to say was uh, you do have second thoughts about saying anything to people who have, quote, normal lives. Uh, and, and you don't want them to feel that you're, you're bragging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, no, it, uh, to me, it was just when I was writing the book, it was just sharing the joy of the blessing of having all those experiences yes. Yes. rather than, oh, look what I did. No. Well. Well, <laughs> with that, <laughs> Chet Huntley. Um, now I will do some <laughs> some name dropping here, but sure. on, it, but it's all true. I I had the blessing, and the privilege to have the friendships and really close friendships with Chet Huntley, and uh, Sam Donaldson, who is still a dear friend, uh, Ted Koppel, who was a nearby neighbor of mine in in Potomac, Maryland, and um, uh, several others. But Huntley, uh, and my second cousin, Cecil Brown, was one of Edward R. Murrow's boys in London during World War II. So I was kind of born into this business a little bit. Yeah. And he had Keep been- Keep name dropping. It feels <laughs> really great to listen to those. Oh, you're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Cecil's mother and my grandmother, my maternal grandmother were sisters. So my mom grew up with Cecil in Pittsburgh, uh, my hometown, and um, uh, when we moved to New York to have my continued acting career go farther, um, we spent a lot of time with Cecil, and, and he even has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He's, he's long gone now. But the other boys with him in, in London were Cronkite and Eric Severide and Charles Collingwood and Robert Trout and all these wonderful, fantastic news people. But Cecil was torpedoed. Ten, day, 10 days, this is how he got the Murrow job. Uh, 10 days after uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed, he was in the South Pacific, Southwest Pacific, on a British freighter, or that was a, it was a destroyer, actually, uh, called the HMS Repulse. And they were torpedoed by the Japanese, and Cecil held on to whatever he had to held on, hold on to to survive, and Murrow heard about it, and in those days sent a, a wire, a telegram, uh, to the ship saying, we want to talk to, to, to Cecil to become one of our reporters in London. Wow. And that's how that happened. I always say the best things in life happen by accident, <laughs> but I, I know it's divine intervention for sure. So, um, but for all the other news people, uh, Huntley was, was wonderful. And Chet was from a small town too, Cardwell, Montana. Yes. And, uh, I asked him once, I said, do you miss the news business? And he said, are you kidding me? He said, it's coming in such big chunks now. He said, I would never be able to do it. Do you miss the news business and do you feel the same way? I don't feel, and I think probably uh, Chet was uh, saying something that wasn't completely true that he wouldn't be able to handle it because I don't know anything that uh, could ever be too heavy for Chet to lift because he was uh, that uh, interesting person who uh, anchored, uh, of course, his foil uh, in Washington, D.C. was David Brinkley, and, 
and David was always very uh, uh, <laughs> obtuse in what he had to say and a little bit of a North Carolina accent. And Chet Huntley was just this very almost stiff presence, very serious almost all the time. So I know that he could have lifted any of the heavy weights that are coming our way these days and were coming his way at that time, including Watergate and the Vietnam War. Uh, but uh, what he says resonates with me because uh, people ask me, do I miss the news business? And I do not. I do not miss the news business because it's not the business that I was in. It has changed so remarkably. Yeah. And I saw that train coming down the track. I saw the change. And uh, I didn't like what was coming. And I used to uh, win uh, most major arguments as the newsroom leader uh, and the senior reporter on substance versus style. And in the later years that I was there, I was losing every argument, every argument. Style was more important. Ratings were more important than uh, the information that you could provide people so they could develop an informed opinion, which I believe is the, the absolute uh, zenith of journalistic work. You're not telling people what to do. You're giving them the information and saying, know this and proceed. But if you remember, <clears throat> in 1976, Patty Chayefsky wrote a uh, p piece for uh, motion pictures uh, called Network. Mm -hmm. And in it, Albert Finney plays an anchor named Howard Beale. And at some point, Howard Beale goes a little mad and begins telling the full truth, which you uh, are not supposed to do. And he was the one who, uh, even our younger viewers would recognize this and say, I want you to get up. I want you to stand up right now and I want you to go to the window. I want you to stick your head out and I want you to scream, I'm as mad as hell and I am not going to take this anymore. Well, I think that there was some suspicion on the part at WCCO that I was about to go full Howard Beale. Now, I wasn't going mad, but I was mad. I was angry that we were not doing, not just the CCO, nationwide. Nationwide, even at the networks, even the cable operations. We're not doing the serious work of informing the public on what was the major issues of the day. And now we're in a situation where uh, the current occupant of the White House is uh, saying things about the press that it uh, is not to be believed and is uh, an enemy of the people. I think I'm quoting him correctly. Uh, that's causing uh, some comeuppance because it was drifting toward not being an enemy of the people, but certainly not a journalistic friend of the people because it was so busy trying to be popular. And uh, I don't buy the idea of fake news. I never saw bias within the news story in my life. But bias does exist in the choice of the story you choose to tell. And so if uh, all you're getting is uh, negative news about one person on one channel and positive news only about the same person on another channel, then uh, there's something rotten in Denmark unless the people who are telling those stories are so frightened that there is something terrible happening to the democracy that they're doing the best they can to ring the bell of alarm. Uh, part of the job of journalism is to report clear and present danger. Let the people know something harmful is happening. Yeah. But they're doing it with a dearth of facts and facts be have become very in in this period of time, something I have always relied on, I've believed that in fact, fact is the most important, objective truth is the most important thing to me. Yeah. Whether it comes from the left or whether it comes from the right, whether it comes from the farmer or it comes from the urban dweller, there is an objective truth. Two plus two is four. 
that cannot be argued can be demonstrated. Two plus two is four. Some string theorists may say, well, I can make it change. But we know two plus two is four. Two apples and two apples make four apples. That's an objective truth. And when news people try to tell an objective truth, where the, all the evidence available says this is where the truth lies in this spectrum, and it's disregarded by the audience, the truth is disregarded by the audience, then based on either a political affiliation or faith or belief or uh, an inclination, something that uh, Uncle Fred told them was true, as opposed to what the evidence says, where the preponderance of evidence lies, the underpinning of the civil court system uh, that's put before juries. You're not asked to decide to a moral certainty whether this is true. You're just to decide where the evidence, the, the, the heaviest degree of evidence lies and make a decision based on that. That we find ourselves in a world where reality has become a matter of whatever it is you believe is true. Mm -hmm. And that cannot stand, a democracy cannot stand if people will see the truth presented to them and turn away from it and say that can't be true. I don't believe it. I will not believe it because it doesn't square with my own bias, my own set of beliefs, my own political affiliation. So I don't know how the press can uh, tell the truth when to many people the truth doesn't matter. I would be so frustrated, Barry, if I were still in the business of trying to purvey the objective truth. So fantastic uh, an analysis and uh, it's all true what you just said um, uh, <clears throat> without getting too political uh, but let's face it we we know what we're facing these days um, where do you see uh, based on your years of experience in covering truth and journalism uh, and everything uh, do you see this current situation existing after the, uh, the current occupant in the White House uh, leaves? Or will we be get back to some sense of dignity and quality and normalcy? Well, it all depends on what the public decides, what the truth is. Sometimes to the public, if the stock market is doing well, then uh, all other sins are forgiven. All, all lies, all uh, misdeeds, uh, whatever proved or not proved, um, whatever uh, moral compass the person might have, those are forgiven. And it's just not the current occupant. That's been true uh, throughout our history uh, because we make decisions based on how good we feel mm. as individuals, not how good the country feels. Uh, if we're doing well, we like the guy in office or the woman in office. We like that person because they're making my life better. 80 of 87 counties in Minnesota voted for Donald Trump. 80 of 87 counties. Wow. So uh, I have to take great care in, in being um, equanimous in how I approach this story, knowing that there are great numbers of people who uh, believed a change was necessary mm -hmm. and uh, voted, I, I think, voted their, their consciences, but their consciences being guided by their own condition. Mm -hmm. If you were in Cleveland and you didn't vote for Donald Trump, uh, I would think you were uh, mindless because he said, I'm going to bring all your steel mills back. Yeah. Well, uh, I'd vote for him if I were a steel worker. Mm -hmm. If somebody told me that. Yeah. Hillary Clinton didn't tell him that. That's right. Donald Trump told him that. And here was a businessman who had the capacity to make deals. And maybe he would. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll get my job back. Oh, I guarantee you. 
uh, you'd have to be crazy not to vote for him. Mm -hmm. So I understand. Uh, my daughter called me after the election and said, what has happened to my country? And I said, nothing at all. This is the same country uh, you uh, went to sleep in last night. It didn't change. Mm -hmm. These people exist. These people have uh, earnest concerns and desires. And they think this person can fix their heartache. Mm -hmm. And they believe and are willing to accept some foibles if, if this person can turn things around for their life. Not for the country, for their life. And I don't, uh, I don't uh, chastise them for that because that's how we have to make our decisions, what's best for us and our family. Yeah. It's interesting to, to see him. I, I minored in psychology, <laughs> which just doesn't, uh, doesn't make me a psychologist. But it's really interesting to see the evolution of uh, Mr. Trump uh, almost from day to day. But the, uh, we're taping this uh, after he has just uh, finished the Davos uh, appearance. And in many ways, I think he's listening uh, more to a lot of other people to whom he didn't listen before. But um, I had a glimmer of hope uh, in recent days and maybe by the time this airs, <laughs> this, will, this will be, be different. It changes daily. <laughs> yes, but um, he um, he seems to the the only uh, really argument I have with him, and that does make me really angry, is the that term fake news. It's it's a crutch with which he can. If, if he just doesn't like something, he, he immediately says fake news. And that's not right. It's not fair. It's not true. And that's the only thing, really, that, that bugs me about him. <laughs> and and uh, luckily on this show, this is not a news show. This is an interview show <laughs> and, and so forth and so on. But that's the thing that really irritates, because I think in, in, within his own brain, he doesn't believe it's fake news. It's just something to escape the whatever, if he doesn't like a particular story. Well, if it doesn't uh, jibe with his truth, yeah. then it must be a lie. <laughs> and I think uh, that is the way people absorb a lot of information these days, because they judge it against their own set of beliefs and their own set of truths. Yeah. But. Uh, once again, I return to the fact that you cannot argue with an objective fact. People ask me all the time, who should I watch or who should I read? Uh, students ask me this quite a bit. Uh, people on social media quite a little bit. And the first thing I tell them is don't ever get any news from social media. Don't ever. Now that's an, and I'm on social media and, and I, I get guided, but I don't trust a thing on social media. And I trust nothing in a blog. Uh, the quick answer to who do you trust is the, uh, the person who is reporting the story who will be fired if they knowingly report a falsehood. Because that is the standard of this industry. Yeah. Uh, I was told once uh, by Ray Miller in, in Houston, Texas, you have only one job, Don. Get it right. There you go. And if you get it wrong, you're fired. That's great. And so here are people who have dedicated their whole education, their whole adult lives, to trying to get it right. And when they tell a story, if they know that what they're saying is false, they will lose their job and will never work again in the business of their choice and they lose uh, a way to support their families. And no one, no one I've ever known would do that knowingly, mm -hmm. put that kind of thing at risk. That's not to say that uh, our, the journalists haven't made mistakes. In fact, the Supreme Court of the United States has decided that journalists uh, can freely make mistakes when they're talking about public officials in the in the free exercise of truth-seeking 
mistakes are bound to be made, and they will not try to uh, inhibit a reporter's diligent efforts by, by saying that a, an error is a wrong. Sometimes we misspell a name. Can't go to jail on a misspelled name, the Supreme Court says. Uh, sometimes you uh, say something wrong, and when you find it's wrong, you immediately apologize and correct it. Mm -hmm. um, it is a standard of this business to do that. And I, uh, I ask this audience, is there any other profession that you know of in the world where the primary standard is to tell the truth all the time? Well. Wow. That says it. That nails it. It's true. I want to go back briefly to Chet Huntley and David Brinkley. Sure. Um, when I moved to Washington, D.C., I knew Chet's uh, widow to Tippy Stringer. And Tippy said, well, David actually introduced Chet and me. And so she told me the story that she was the color girl for NBC in New York or in D.C., and Chet was in New York. And he said, who's the, who's the girl? To David, and he said, and he said, well, I can introduce you. So <laughs> they got introduced, and of course, eventually got married. So Tippy said, when you go to D.C., just call David and say hello, and perhaps you two will get together sometime. So, uh, but just say hi for me. So I got hold of David up at WRC, and <laughs> I said, my name is Barry Zivan. I've just joined Channel 7, and uh, Tippy and I are friends, and uh, she just instructed me to say hello for her. And he said, thank you. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> David Brinkley said two words to me. Thank you. <laughs> I said, well, bye -bye. And I'll never forget him. <laughs> no. <laughs> but at least he was polite. <laughs> now the uh, that's that is something too. Now our cities, the Twin Cities, um, when we're taping this, we're taping this uh, a little bit over a week before the Super Bowl happens, and I think the people uh, in in the rest of the world and the rest of this country, as I say thanks to YouTube, uh, we're, we're seeing everywhere and anywhere, but um, they don't realize the, the strength of these, these markets, these cities, the, the incredible people who uh, were born here, uh, who, well, you mentioned Jim Arness, of course, and uh, Peter Graves, but J. Paul Getty was born here. Yeah. And, you know, don't forget Paul, Bob Dylan, don't they? Bob Dylan, well, up in, yeah, in in Hibby. Duluth, actually yeah. born in Duluth, but then yeah. they raised in Hibbing. I knew his mother briefly. So did I. Oh, B. She went to the same B. Dennis as I did. Oh, she was, she was a wild, wildcat. Yes. A firecracker. And said only in the most loving way, by the way. Yeah, B. Reitman. Yep. And, uh, but it just uh, the numbers of people that, I, th I think I mentioned this a couple of shows ago, uh, Ann Southern, there were so many actors and actresses who came out of here, of course, Eddie Albert, who I got to know, he had a little farm in front of his house in Pacific Palisades. He said he was driving the neighbors crazy because he was growing corn in the front yard. <laughs> and, and he did it on purpose. But um, uh, Ann Southern and I, uh, I was doing, I was filming Art Linkletter for a house party out in Sun Valley, Idaho, and uh, uh, wound up with Ann Southern for some reason at this place called the Boiler Room, which is the actual boiler room for the big hotel in Sun Valley. <laughs> and so it's still on the wall down there. Ann plus Barry, true, you oh, know, <laughs> with a little my. heart, you know. <laughs> Just did our dance. And my wife's watching it. Forget it. No, never did that. Nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, something surely has, has happened uh, to us. Uh, we have about a, another minute or so done. Any, uh, any closing thoughts uh, for our viewers? If I have a closing thought, it would be uh, to uh, ask your audience to uh, rethink the idea of critical thinking. Uh, 
to uh, look at all the evidence of every story. Do not accept anything on its face. Do your own research. Uh, don't read one story and make up your mind. Read several stories. Read uh, the same subject matter from a different point of view. Understand what uh, someone who doesn't agree with you thinks. Uh, and, and rather than be angry, see if there's anything instructive in there that can add or detract from your own position. Because what we lack today, it seems to me, as I say, sitting here long in the tooth and gray in the beard, is uh, critical thinking. The country lacks the ability, generally, to critically think and to arrive at a reality that is the basis upon which they will form an informed opinion. And that requires critical thinking, not repeating what someone else has said, uh, not taking on face value what your party says, whichever party it might be. Uh, but to do the hard work of being a citizen, Barry. The hard work of being a citizen. Being a citizen is not easy. Amen. Amen to that. If you work to improve yourself, and when you've improved yourself, you work to help others improve themselves. And when that's completed, you work to help improve the condition of your city and your county and your state and your country and the planet, if you can hold that as something important in your life, that your role as a citizen is to do all those things, then I think the public is going to be um, an admirable public. Well, we admire you and thank you so much for taking all this wonderful time to uh, share with our audience. Uh, very briefly, the book, Barry Zuban, My Life Among the Giants, it's on Amazon. Uh, hope you choose to get it.